So we're going to look at a, a parable this morning. Uh, we're in a series called Jesus, and it's a Jesus according to the Gospel of Luke. And I just want you to know, if you don't know this about me, um, I don't have a lot of skill sets outside of the one skill set that I love, which is teaching the scriptures. And I'm realizing I'm very limited in my skill and ability. And I just want to stick to my wheelhouse, if you will. And what I, I realize is that when you look at scriptures, and when you look at the biblical teachings found in the scriptures, that Jesus is so compelling, that Jesus is revealed to be someone who is interruptible, compassionate and kind and slow and generous and powerful, and he breaks social barriers, as we learned last week, to include outsiders, and in last week's sermon, women, to be part of his inner circle and followers. We see that discipleship is more in the scriptures, more than just an intellectual belief about knowledge of God and what he's like or doctrine. It's more than that. It's about letting go of old ways. It's about releasing everything that you once defined yourself as in order to be redefined by following him. It's about bringing everything you have to Jesus and allowing him to restructure and redefine and reorient your life around his very existence and being. So when we look at scripture, we see Jesus is this incredible being, this person, this God who lived in human history, died on a cross and raised from the dead. And I'm a witness of that resurrection life because I was once in darkness and now I'm in light. I have experienced transformation multiple times throughout my life where I was held captive and set free. Even a few weeks ago, I've shared the story. I was dealing with serious things that impacted my family for months and months, seven months to be exact. And in the matter of prayer and a word of knowledge and, um, and, and coming under the authority of Jesus, I was set free. And, and I, just, I just believe more today than I did yesterday that Jesus is who he is in the scriptures and he is that today. Now, I want you to know this. I want you to experience this Jesus. And so I have a talk um, and I want to wade into a topic this morning that has significant implications for how we live and interact with each other and people around us, especially uh, this particular year, a year that is marked by elections and politics. And I think this particular topic helps us transcend uh, the fighting that goes on because it will show us how we ought to live and interact in the world. So Jesus used parables to communicate his ideas. And parables are rabbinic teaching tool. They're word pictures. They're stories that force you to reflect on the implications as you walk away and go about your ordinary life after you hear this story. And they're often challenges to the way people see it coming or the way they thought it would come. But the problem with parables today, especially this particular parable, is we are all familiar with the story. And Dallas Willard says familiarity leads, sorry, familiarity has led to unfamiliarity. And unfamiliarity has led to contempt and contempt has led to a profound ignorance. I'm quoting my favorite Dallas Willard, of course. So we're going to jump in. But before I, I tell the parable, I need to let you know the context of the story. The context of this parable has something to do with eternal life. So let's read Luke chapter 10, and we'll start in verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place that, and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came there, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. When he put the man on, then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look, look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. Most of us have heard this story. How many of you have never heard the story? Raise your hand. Let's see the one. See, there's a few of us. That's great. 
So the majority of us have heard this story, but most of us have heard the phrase, even if we've never heard the story, Good Samaritan. Would you agree with that? Because this story is, if, if, if the story we've heard is usually about becoming the kind of person that pulls over when somebody has a flat tire and helps them out, be a good Samaritan. Isn't that what this story is about? Thank you for one of you that want to participate. Yes! This is what it means to be a good Samaritan. Stop when the car accident takes place. And if we were to just stop there and talk about what love looks like, I just, I mean, it's fascinating what the Samaritan does in the story. First of all, it says that he saw the man. How many of us are trying not to see the pain in the world? Love requires us to see. It says it took, he took pity on him, which is the Greek word for compassion. Compassion is I have to do something about it, not do I have to do something about it. He bandaged his wounds, which means he touched the man who was half dead, willing to get his hands dirty on behalf of the pain that others have. He puts him on his donkey, which means he changes places with the with the man. So if you were to walk next to a donkey, the symbol of that moment is that you are the servant to the man on the donkey. Are you willing to to become lower, take the lower position in order to to raise others up in their need? And then it says he takes him to the inn and tells the innkeeper, I'm going to pay his expenses. So he pays the debt that would inquire for the man who is suffering. He pays for the needs. He he sacrifices. His love costs him something significant. So if we are to focus on love and what love looks like, man, this is an amazing story. A love that takes risk, risks. A love that shares burdens. A love that goes out of the way. A love that takes time and energy and commitment and follow through and finances. But that's not what this story is about. The Good Samaritan is not about being a Good Samaritan. If we make it about that part of the story, we miss the point of the story in the first place. The reason why Jesus tells the story is he is responding to a question that a lawyer has in Luke chapter 10. So let's just go through this now. I want to just break down this text. And I promise you, we're going to just go through context and history And then we're going to land with some practical things. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, it says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There it is, the question. A couple of things you need to know about that question and about this expert in the law or the lawyer. The lawyer already has an opinion about the question. This is what the lawyer does for a living. He is an expert in the law, in the Old Testament. He probably has it memorized. This is what he spent hours of his day focused on and years of his life discussing and debating the meaning of scriptures and uh, and what was most important. He was one of the elites. He was part of the religious establishment. And when the lawyer asked the question about eternal life, he's not asking about what happens in life after death. What happens when you die was not a question that a first century Jew would have been concerned about during their time. During Jesus' day in the first century, people were concerned not about life after death, but life before death, here and now. So when you had a chance to interact with a rabbi or a spiritual leader or a teacher, the first question you would ask is what, how do I have the best, fullest filled, most significant life here and now. This is what he's asking. You see, eternal life was, not a, was about a certain kind of quality of life that came from right relationship with God, and it came from living in shalom and harmony and peace with God based on your understanding of the Torah. So he asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? How do I really live here and now? And Jesus responds with a question. What is written in the law? And then another question. How do you read it? So Jesus responds to his question like a rabbi with a question about his interpretation of the Torah. Jesus, by the way, just a quick side note. I love this fact. Jesus asks 307 questions in the Gospels. He is asked 183 questions and only directly answers three questions. Doesn't that just frustrate you? (laughs) What is that about? 
Well, what it's about, by the way, is a rabbinic form of teaching that was not about, transforma- or not about transferring of knowledge, but of transformation. Because it forces people to think deeply. We love, give me the three points. Give me the quick answers. Give me the tweetable line in the sermon so I get it. Seven ways to heal my marriage. Boom, one, two, three. We love that in our Western context. But what rabbis would do is force you to go home and and let it uh, simmer and marinate in your soul. So the lawyer isn't surprised by the question, right? This This is how you do things in the Jewish context. You ask questions and you ask other questions to ask questions and you answer questions with questions. It's super frustrating. So he was ready to answer. Now, let's pause for a second. Before we jump into his answer, can I just make some historical uh, context for you that will help you understand what's going on here? So about 50 years before Jesus comes on into history in, in, in the New Testament, uh, before he's uh, ministering in Galilee, there were two famous rabbis, really famous rabbis, that had famous debates about their interpretation of the Torah and the scriptures that were recorded right before Jesus comes onto the scene. They're known as Rabbi Shammai, and Rabbi Hillel. You should write these down. Rabbi Shammai and Hillel have significant influence in the gospel stories because these were two rabbis that you see their debates where teachers of the law and experts and Pharisees wanted to know where Jesus sided. Which which side would he take, Shammai or Hillel? Shammai was a Pharisee, okay? Now, the debates were all over the place for various things, on divorce, on taxes, on um, the second command. Now, check this out. Um, The most famous debate was the second greatest commandment. 613 commands in the Old Testament, in the Torah, the first five books. And back then, people would rank the commandments like college football teams today, in order. And every rabbi and famous spiritual leader were trying to condense the law to the least amount required, which is why we get this, this moment in, in our scriptures where Jesus kind of acknowledges the two most important commandments in the Old Testament. The first was known, it was Deuteronomy 6, 5, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is the greatest commandment. Everyone knew that. By the way, the last word in Hebrew for strength is mahode which means like best translated, like your muchness. Love the, it's like, love the Lord your God with all your strength, your might, your much, the atoms and quarks that make your body. Love the, the God, your God with everything that you possess in your being. That's the word that the Hebrews use for loving your God. Love every, let every quark and atom inside your body to love God. How are we doing with that? Now, the second command was debated, and Shammai and Hillel differed on the second command. Shammai believed that Leviticus 19.2 was the second greatest command. Be holy as God is holy. He was a Pharisee. Hillel believed that the second greatest command was to love your neighbor as yourself. So the lawyer responds, and this is the lawyer's response. In other gospel accounts, Jesus responds. The lawyer responds and says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your muchness or strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. You will experience the life that is truly life. Eternal life, here and now. The life you were designed to live. A life marked by shalom and peace with God. And this is it. Jesus answers the question. Exchange done. Nothing more to talk about. The lawyer asks a question. Jesus asks him a question about his question. He answers the question to his own question. Jesus tells him, you got it right. Conversation all over. But the conversation isn't over. 29. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? He wanted to justify himself. He wanted to prove his way right. In other words, The lawyer had an agenda. This is, my brothers and sisters, where everything goes south in conversations. Would you agree? Like, anyone here ever asked a question that they already had an answer to? And as the person begins to speak, you're just waiting for the opportunity to tell them your thoughts? Like, when we engage in discussions with a purpose and a mission to convert somebody to our opinion, we rarely listen to understand. And this approach to conversations breaks connection. 
Let me just help all your marriages and seriously dating people out there. If you learn, actually, even if you have a strong opinion about something, to listen to the other person, to try to understand, because let me just say this, you have a perspective which is your reality. And when you're constantly trying to force your reality on everyone else who also has a perspective in their own reality, it's not going to work very well unless you learn how to engage in listening and understanding without an agenda to win. Everyone got quiet real quick. (laughs) So let me just also say, you can't really do this well on online platforms. Can I just make that statement? I don't think you're going to convert many people through tweets or Instagram posts to whatever perspective you have. It's great to send out information, but when people start arguing back, the tone is missed. And we can't be jerks on a, online ever because we're Christian. Wow, it got real quiet. You can't possibly do the things like, can I just confess something to you? Can I just confess something? What, I just, should I confess this? Yeah, babe, I'll do it. So I was in Big Bear over the, uh, over the week. I, t- on, uh, I went with our family, and we went to a restaurant that we didn't have reservations. And when they, we called to get reservations for six adults and six kids, they, they kind of said, well, why don't you just come in early, and we'll get you in. And then we got there super early at 4.30. And there's like two parties in this massive restaurant, and they, they couldn't accommodate our party. And they recommended other places because I don't think they wanted the six little kids in there. Well, there was only two little kids, but six kids. And so whenever there's any kind of injustice, not just like this kind of injustice, but any kind of injustice, I get like, I don't know, (laughs) frustrated. I'm holding my two-year-old outside and they're they're not letting us. What? I like walk in there and then I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to. I'm going to walk out. I'm going to walk out. So then privately, as our tr- party walks down the street, I get on Yelp. And then Jesus is like, oh, really, Darren? And so I did not post, but I released. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, what is that inside of us? I'm just going to make sure everyone knows how mean and unjustifiably rude this restaurant. It's not. It wasn't. It was just, it made sense. I wouldn't want my two-year-old in that restaurant either. (laughs) Uh, So we have this this, uh, setup, right? The lawyer sets him up, and he has an agenda uh, from the beginning, something that Jesus is living and demonstrating, even though they believe the the same view of Hillel, love your neighbor as yourself, he now wants to understand something about Jesus' life doesn't demonstrate the experience or belief that the lawyer has in the same law. Does that make sense? So he sees love your neighbor as yourself different than the way Jesus sees it based on how Jesus is living. So he wants to justify himself. Who's my neighbor? You see, a neighbor in the first century was someone who looked like you, acted like you, talked like you, had the same accent like you, dressed like you, voted like you, had the same religious spiritual views as you, cheered for the Lakers like you. Or whatever sports team you prefer. Obviously, the Laker fans. Anyways, <clears throat> moving on. And just kidding. And Pharisees believed that a neighbor was a practicing Jew. So someone who observed all of the 613 commands plus the 1,500 oral traditions they added on. So if you didn't practice Judaism the way that a Pharisee practiced Judaism, the resources of your love were exempt from those kinds of people. In other words, only people who were like you deserved the resources of your love. Those were your neighbors. Love the Lord your God. And love your neighbor as yourself. And the question or the the contingency the lawyer has is he wants to know the bottom line. Who's in and who's out? Which is always a byproduct of religion. Byproduct of religion is give me the rule, give me a list to obey because that's how we justify our behaviors. We feel better about ourselves when we do our spiritual exercises when we follow our spiritual tasks and to-do lists. It's easier that way. I would rather learn to follow a list than than learn how to do it naturally. I would rather have rules 
to know how I compare with everyone else out there because I could do a little bit better than he, rather than learn to let the life of God be the source of my activity in the world. I would rather know the limitations of my resources, have a budget per se, uh, rather than allow my life to be lived by compassion because compassion moves you to do something about everything that is in front of you. Compassion pushes you beyond what's com comfortable and beyond what's safe because love must compel us to move forward. Love must drive us, not lists, but it's love that drives you to your brother or sister, to your neighbor. It's in 1 John 3.16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees our brother and sister in need but has no compassion on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear, dear children, let us not love with our words or speech or lists, but with actions and in truth. I had lists in there. Actions and in truth. You can't separate the love of God from the love of others. And love is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's a declarative act towards one another. So we can't possibly truly love like Jesus if we want to know the bottom line. If we want to know who my neighbor is. And it's from here, this question, who is my neighbor, that Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. It says, I'm going to read it over again. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead like a corpse. Now, Jerusalem to Jer Jericho was a treacherous road. It was a 17-mile stretch. Jerusalem was 2,300 miles above sea level. Jericho was 1,300 miles below sea level. So this was a descent downwards, and it, it was a narrow passageway where on one side of the narrow passageway was a cliff, and the other side was the mountain. And so this man is stripped of any mechanism of identification, so your capacity to identify this person's language or, or, or identity of clothes based on what they wore was no longer, you had no, long, no capacity to do that. So then the story continues. A priest happened to be going down that same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite. And he came to the place and saw him and passed by on, on the other side. The priest was of the noble class, the upper class. They worked two weeks on at the temple and two weeks off. So here you have the story of somebody who's working in the temple in Jerusalem offering sacrifices, providing worship on behalf of others, speaking, reading scriptures, being a spiritual leader, leader, doing the work of God. And he's probably going home to Jericho, which was the second most populated city outside of Jerusalem. A Levite was like a servant or security guard, a helper in the temple. They were spiritual leaders as well in the temple. They weren't upper class but they were uh, under the priests. The priests were their boss. And they had a significant role in providing support to the worship of Israelites. And he too passed on the other side. Now what's funny is there is no other side. So anyone hearing this story would have been like, there's no other side to pass on. It's either a treacherous cliff down the way or it's up the cliff. You can't possibly, so it's a joke already. We immediately think though the priests and the Levite are bad guys. But that's not how you would have heard this in the first century. It says that the man on the road was beaten, bloody, and nearly dead. Remember, this story has something to do with eternal life. Don't forget. How do I live the life that God desires me to live? Loving your neighbor as yourself. Clarifying with the question, who is my neighbor? Torah teaches you that if you touch someone else's blood, you are unclean. If you touch a corpse, you're unclean. A priest and a Levite would be marked as unclean. They couldn't worship God. They wouldn't be able to do the good they were required to do by the law written in the Old Testament. They would be unclean, unfit, defiled. They would walk back to the temple in shame, mocked for breaking the laws of the Old Testament. Some rabbinic teachings say that you can't even look at a corpse or allow your shadow to pass over a corpse because that too would make you unclean. And to be unclean was to be disobedient to the commands of God, to walk outside of the life that is really life, to miss eternal life. So here's the question. How do you interpret the scriptures? Is it strict obedience, be holy as God is holy? Or is it something else? And the story goes on, and we don't get this in our context, okay? So this is where the progression of the story doesn't make any sense. 
In the first century, priest, Levite, a law-abiding Jew. There's no way you would see what Jesus is about to do. It doesn't make any sense. It would have been so shocking. Um, it would be like, have you ever been in a discussion with somebody, maybe your spouse, and they say something to you that sets you off? And now you're triggered by a phrase. Maybe they compared you to uh, you know, your parents or something. Or, or maybe they said a phrase that, that triggered your childhood wounds. And all of a sudden, they're, they're continuing their, their conversation, not knowing that they, something happened inside. And you don't hear anything going on. Do you know what I'm talking about? Am I the only one that struggles to understand the next part because you said this thing and I got offended? Do you know what I'm talking about? So that's what happens here. But we don't get it because we've just watered down this. This word would have been so offensive. It would have caused people to throw their hands, be angry, and walk away from the rest of the story. Because it goes priest, Levite, and then it says, but a Samaritan. The rest of the audience probably didn't hear the rest of the story. They would have been triggered by ancient historical feuds that were ripe inside of their community as Jews. It says that he traveled, and it goes on to talk about what the Samaritan does. This is so offensive. This was unbelievably offensive to a lawyer or a good Jew, a law-abiding Jew. If you would have been listening to the story, you would have been shocked. There would have been an audible gasp. You might have stopped listening, walked away angry. This was repulsive. It was, and and this, is the, this is why I can make the case. If the moral of the story was to go and be a good neighbor, then you wouldn't need to use a Samaritan to make the case. You could just use a law-abiding Jew, an ordinary tax collector. Even that is a little less offensive than a Samaritan. See, this is about eternal life. I, I want to keep putting that out there. This message has something to do with eternal life. Samaritans were hated by the Jews, especially experts of the law or Pharisees. And it stems back to an ancient historical feud when the Assyrians conquered northern Israel and Judah and colonized that part of Israel. They mixed with the Jews and they created a new race. Half Assyrian, half Jew equals a Samaritan. And they mixed religious views and practices with the Assyrian views and practices. Jews considered these people pagans and heretics. This is the worst form of immorality you could possibly imagine in the first century. To mix worship of Yahweh with other deities, to practice some form of Judaism and incorporate pagan practices. The Jews and Samaritan battled in war for centuries. Over 700 years, they fought against each other. At one point in history, there was a season where the Jews tried to ethically cleanse the Samaritans. This is first century form of racism, religious, political, ideological, systemic, and personal opposition and marginalization of a people group. And the Samaritan, the word itself, was a derogatory word. It's used as an insult to Jesus. In John chapter 8, verse 48, look at this. It says, the Jews answered him, hey, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? Anyone get an insult in an email before? <laughs> or a tweet that didn't go the way you wanted it to go? Aren't we right in saying that you're, you're a Samaritan and demon-possessed? This is a derogatory word. To the lawyer, this is worse than a Roman. Worse than the Roman citizen or a Roman soldier. A good Samaritan, that is an oxymoron. The only good Samaritan is a dead Samaritan. Disgust. Remember, this has something to do with eternal life. Who is my neighbor is the question. And then it, verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? And the expert in the law replied. Look at his reply. You should highlight it. The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Boom. Do you see it? 
Do you see how insanely brilliant and clever and subversive Jesus is? Please tell me you see this whole thing starts with a question that's loaded, didn't it? Hey, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus does what he does. He tells a story that appears to be rambling off into the woods. And all of a sudden, a shocking character comes out of nowhere. And he's the hero of the story. And then he turns the table on the lawyer and asks, who was the neighbor? And the answer is the Samaritan, right? Yes, that's correct. But the lawyer can't answer the question. He can't even say the name of the person, the one. The one. Because his hate goes so deep that when you hate someone that much, you give them titles, not names. My ex. My old church, my old pastor, my current pastor, <laughs> Bill. <laughs> oh, it's, it, uh, yeah. <laughs> Who was the neighbor? The Samaritan. That's where the eternal life that this lawyer is looking for is found. Okay, now just stay with this moment. In loving your neighbor, in the loving the one that you hate, the one that you despise, the one that you wish didn't exist, the one that you can't even say the name of is the moral of the story. The resource, resources of your love includes your enemies. So when we ask who's in and who's out, the answer is we don't get to decide. Followers of Jesus don't have the luxury of having enemies, brothers and sisters. The world and religion want to shrink your capacity to love based on those who are like you. Jesus wants you to embody his love in which his love has no boundaries and has, makes no exceptions and is completely unconditional. Jesus reveals in the story what God is like. His love is offensive. His love extends to people on the outside. His love extends to those kinds of people, the ones you wish didn't exist. And Jesus offers a better way to live, a way that leads to eternal life. And so when he asks about how do you inter inher inherit eternal life, how do you live the life that is really life, Jesus identifies the pain, the anger, and hate he identifies the unforgiveness that held the lawyer captive. In the same way with the rich young ruler, he lifts all the laws and he says, you forgot one. Sell your possessions. Thou shalt not covet is your heart issue. And this particular st story, this particular heart issue has to be with who's in and who's out. Where do the resources of my love go? And the lawyer needed to be released of his categories his rules, in order to include the people that he had been trained to exclude. Eternal life is about experiencing life the way God intended it. The only way we really get there, though, is by living life the way Jesus lived it, through forgiveness. The only way we're going to heal the world is to start with our own hearts and offer forgiveness to those that we need to forgive. And that's where this story goes, if you allow it. We can stay on the surface and like, oh, let's be good neighbors. Yes. Let's go stop and love sacrificially. Yes. But it's deeper. It's like Jesus, take, that's, just, that's just the starting point. Where, where this goes, where this is going to lead us is, there, are there any people in your life that have hurt you, that has caused deep pain? Are there people who have misunderstood you, rejected you, caused offense? Are there people you are still holding on to? that you need to release. In our world, we are offended so easily. People hurt us and it causes pain. And pain leads to offense. And offense leads to bitterness. And bitterness leads to resentment. And when we get to resentment, we can justify behaviors. But resentment turns into hate. And this process becomes a prison of unforgiveness. And offense is a trap the enemy uses and unforgiveness is the prison he, we lock ourselves in with the key. 
So many people in this room are held captive today by their anger, their resentment, and their unforgiveness. You might not use the word hate, but you definitely are, are held captive by your feelings towards others. And I just want to say, I think with the Good Samaritan story, the point is we will miss out on what God is doing in the world if we are holding on to any form of bitterness, anger, resentment, and unforgiveness towards anyone in the world. You didn't see that coming, huh? Let's just talk about being AAA for people. Roadside assistant. I like that. I can, do, I can make a list with that one. Can I have a quick disclaimer? Now, obviously, some people we need to avoid. I want to just, I'm not saying, don't hear me saying something that I'm not saying. So let me just say it perfectly clear. Some people we have to have boundaries with. Amen. Some people are so toxic and dangerous and hurtful. Some people have done so much damage to us that we have to keep a distance. We can't see them. But even them, we forgive so that the hate and bitterness won't eat us alive. We love them from a distance. That's part of being healthy. Is there anyone here that you're holding on a grudge to? Is there anyone here who's got that person in their heart that they need to forgive or ask forgiveness from? I wonder if anyone here is holding on to something that they need to let go of, like the ex, the old roommate, the old business partner, the old boss, seriously, the old church, the old pastor, seriously, the current pastor. Anyone here that has feeling people in their life that when you actually start to think about it, you get upset, you cry, you get mad, you get angry, and then you start to think of all the reasons why. Can you name them? If you were to ask Jesus to identify those people in your life that are still holding space in your heart and head, could you name them? You see, as you begin to name them, you'll begin to lose power. They'll begin to lose power in your life. I don't think God will allow us as a church to move into the next season of flourishing unless we resolve in ourselves to forgive those that have harmed us. Now let me just talk about forgiveness for a second. You don't have to sit down with that person or text and say, I forgive you. The process, some, some people, you need to hash out things because it's been, most of the time, can I just say this? It's an internal process with Jesus to set you free and release that person to, the, to God. So the process begins with naming them, writing it down, and then pray for them, and then forgive them. Ask Jesus to help you to forgive them. Forgiveness is not a one-time act. The forgiveness is an ongoing act. Um, I, sh- I say this in our household. I learned it from somebody, and I'm, I'm forgetting what, what actually I shouldn't share it, but this idea that when I do something wrong to Alex, which happens rather frequently in our home, would you give me an amen to that? Yes, yeah, show so. <laughs> she never makes mistakes, so there you go. Um, but when I make a mistake in front of our kids, I, I make it a point to go and I, I apologize in front of them because it started in front of them to Alex. And I ask for forgiveness. And then I go and I, I'll speak to both my boys and ask for their forgiveness because forgiveness sets the standard again, right? So it sets the standard. You can't talk to me or react to me based on what I just did. Now the standard is new. It's, you are forgiven. I am forgiven. I'm going to walk in that new standard. That's what we do with people. Even though they did those things in the past, we release them and give them a new standard to live by so we don't allow the past to pull us into a place of bitterness and anger. So name them, pray for them, forgive them, release them, and bless them. If people in my life that have hurt me, people in my life that uh, have done things that have caused me to think ill thoughts towards them, and I'm not just talking about people that cut me off on the freeway, but I'm talking about serious things, and the Lord revealed those things to me, and where I've been competitive with people or uh, for people that have actually done harm, the Lord t- told me, I want you to start blessing them, asking for my favor to rest on your enemies. So they're not my enemies as I pray blessing over their kids and over their kids' kids. 
over uh, the things that have been done. And that's where God will lead us. And that's what this parable is about. It's about recognizing the, uh, the kind of space that's in our hearts for people that we've created categories for. And eternal life has something to do with releasing those that have harmed us the same way Jesus has released us.